pineapple and pizza, yes or no? Yes. Yes. You can never go wrong with culinary choices. <laughs> I won a raffle, took the cash option, and decided that that was a sign from God or higher power that I'm supposed to go out and, and chase this dream of music. And, and when somebody tells me they want to start a business because they want free time, and they want to travel more, and they want to see their kids more, they got it ass backwards. A team of drivers drive around and drive you in your car home when you drank too much in Old Town. There's definitely enough d drunk people in Scottsdale. You know, back in the day, you would hear about the Gordon Ramsay type chefs just screaming, and you'd have militant kitchens, and that doesn't exist anymore. The, the younger generation prefers to go to festivals. They'd rather go to Coachella and EDC than go to a mega nightclub at night. They want to be entertained. They don't want to just go get shit-faced on vodka soda. Go to a market, and we'll have five, six, seven meals in, in one day. You know, we'll try to do two or three lunches, hit a happy hour spot, and do four dinners. And after the first two... <laughs> Can we come on the next trip? <laughs> yeah, it sounds, it sounds fun. So, what, is, what is carry on? <laughs> so we're getting to carry on. Uh, carry on. <laughs> You know what it takes to sell real estate? The art of putting the deal together. I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing this because this is my call. I believe in it. I love it. Try to master your craft and don't give up. Even if the money's not coming in, just trust the process. Because you're only as good as your team. I learned that the hard way. Half of it is talent. The other half of it is what your people's skills are. Welcome back to the Let's Talk development show where we talk about all things business, real estate, and we're super excited for today's episode. Well, we're Max and Patrick, and uh, Max is going to give you a little rundown. So we're two Germans, I guess. Uh, we're passionate about real estate. Uh, we've been doing this for about seven years. Uh, we love all things business, and uh, we're very well connected in the local community, and uh, we can't wait to introduce today's guest. And... Uh, Talk about a little bit of something different other than real estate today. Yeah, and before we start, make sure to like, subscribe, uh, hit the follow button, share, send to everybody, and uh, turn on the bell to make all our guys behind the camera happy. And uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll get going. So now on today's episode, uh, we have a truly inspiring guest joining us uh, who became a good friend of ours over the last couple of months, Arizona native, who's the ultimate uh, dream catcher and entrepreneur. Uh, from a professional rock star, uh, I have seen actual pictures of that, um, <laughs> who started his own record label, made music and toured around the country to now a very successful restaurateur. Him and his wife, Caitlin, have quickly put their stamp on a restaurant industry and the culinary scene here locally in Arizona. He's the owner and developer of some of your favorite go-to spots in here, here in Arizona, such as Ren and Wolf, Trophy Room, Carry On, and Chico Malo, which also has a location in Miami. His company is called Pretty Decent Concepts, and I know there's a lot more coming here in the next couple of years. Uh, we're super excited, and with that, welcome to the show, Teddy. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. All right, well, uh, we'll always start with a little bit of a rapid fire just to get warmed up. Uh, you can make those answers either really short or if there's something you want to elaborate on for a minute, feel free. Um, what kind of music are you listening to right now? Ooh, right now, all over the place, you know, Deep House to classic deep tracks, yeah, everything. But I think the most inspiring is when I can get lost in something like Rufus Dussault, yeah. you know, go on a walk, clear my head before I get into work. Good stuff. What's your favorite food that you cook yourself? Of steak. All day, grilling in the backyard over some form of real wood or charcoal. Get that flavor. Uh, what was your first job, your very first job? I was a cashier at a public pool. <laughs> nice. 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> What's the first concert that you went to? Uh, you know, the first concert that I remember was Paul Revere and the Raiders that my parents took me to. It's like an old, old, like 50s, 60s, maybe 70s, I don't even know, group. They had some random stuff. But the first big concert my parents took me to was Aerosmith. Nice. That's a good one. Uh, pineapple and pizza, yes or no? Yes. Yes. You can never <laughs> go wrong with culinary choices. <laughs> Experiment. Uh, dream vacation. Dream vacation. 
you know, I uh, we want to do a yacht through uh, like the European islands. I think that's the dream vacation. Attainable, doing it soon. Breakfast, lunch, or dinner? Dinner. dinner. I, like, I like the planning phase. I like getting dressed up. I uh, get excited for dinner. Uh, one food or dish that you could just eat forever? You know, it's get any protein. You know, if I would keep it basic, actually, because you could do so much with eggs. It's versatile. You could do dinner. You could do breakfast with it. It gets you the protein you need. It's more utilitarian of an answer, but... <laughs> I, I, I can't do much with eggs, but uh, scrambled, that's it. Um, <laughs> uh, if there was a movie, a, a movie about you, who would play you? Ooh. Uh, Christian Bale. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty intense. He can play my skinny face. He could play <laughs> when I was working out. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Well, let's, uh, now that we're a little warmed up, let's take it uh, maybe to, to the early beginnings. Um, because I know the story, I want you just to, uh, to share as much as you um, feel comfortable sharing about your prior life. And then how did you transition from, you know, the rock star world into hospitality yeah well you know i started playing drums at a very young age my parents required that all of my uh, siblings and i did at least one sport one art and then something that was more social so mine was drums football and then i did student council so i could be well-rounded and the drum thing um I really took a passion to it. I took lessons for 15 years. I played in college. I played at a ASU on the drum line. I taught at a couple high schools. And um, when I dive into something, I dive deep. You know, I go full force ahead and, and try to make it a lifestyle. So when I graduated from college, uh, I was 22, you know, took a job at the Phoenix New Times. And uh, what was the degree you graduated in? Journalism and mass communications. It was a focus on media management. So it was like a business focus, but in the journalism world. Uh, so I took a job at the New Times, but, you know, I was 22 and had a quarter life crisis. I uh, won a lot. It wasn't a lottery. I won a raffle where I got a house. And instead of taking the house, I uh, took the cash option and decided that that was a sign from God or higher power that I'm supposed to go out and, and chase this dream of music. And of course, when you give a 22 year old half million dollars and you know a rock star mentality, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, we had success. We definitely had success. We toured, we had a great manager, um, but figuring out how to make a profit with it was nearly impossible because this was right when everything was going to the streaming. So, you know, CD sales were dying. The choice of music, uh, the direction we went in was dying. And I would attribute it to being the most valuable lessons that I ever had. It's like how to start a business, the grind of making it happen, the marketing, the putting the team together, packaging everything, getting it out there, seeing if people like it, the rejection when people don't, like growing a thick skin, learning to appeal to your audience and find people that really like what you're doing instead of trying to appeal to everybody. So, you know, ton of really valuable lessons in that experience. And I got to wear some eyeliner and skin tight <laughs> leopard pants, you know. I can tell you guys, <laughs> pictures are amazing that I've seen. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was, it was a dream come true at that age. But I also realized that, um, I was, I was the drummer, and I was the, the engine behind that group. I was the one that was making it happening, and I was also hemorrhaging money. So I needed to transition into something that I could be equally passionate about, and I wanted to do it with my wife. I got married young. She was 20. I was 23, and we looked at each other. like We both worked in hospitality. We both love it. It's like all of the same parallels to what we're doing. It's creating something. It's being the driving force, but... When you're in a restaurant, you can control that narrative a bit more. Um, so we started looking at space, and we realized immediately we didn't know what we were doing and we were going to fail. So instead of taking the leap then, we took a scholarly approach to the industry and uh, jumped headfirst into uh, another restaurant group that's very well known in Phoenix, uh, James Beard nominated restaurateur of the year type, and uh, both my Wife and I uh, devoted five years of our life to that company and did everything that we could. 
uh, from management to opening new stores, to, and, and we were a sponge. We learned the industry. We learned how to make money with it. We got to see great people surrounded by great culture, and when we got to the end of it, we um, felt prepared to go and take the leap and open our own restaurant. So that was the plan from the beginning, yeah? You, yeah. you kind of knew that you were going to do it, and you took the approach and took the necessary time until you felt ready? Yeah, I looked at it as an apprenticeship. I was either going to go and get a master's degree, uh, or I was going to go and just look at it as an apprenticeship. And I felt like the latter, being with the company that we chose at that time, um, was the right choice for us. I feel like you can learn a, mo a lot more through experience than you can out of a textbook. 100%, yeah. Like, w what were some of the things that you learned? Like, And it, it must be interesting to know that it's just a step stone, right? So, like, you're already, like, kind of like extracting some ideas, thoughts, processes. Like, what were some of the things that, that along the way you, you kind of, you know, made the key points of what you're going to do afterwards and how you're going to build your business? Yeah. Well, when we were there, that company was transitioning from small, tight company to very big company. And y you could see the pros. You could see what it took to scale. You could see what type of machine it needed to be. And, you know, I coined the term, we wanted to be militant in our processes and procedures. It's one of our core values because that's really what set them apart. There's a lot of people that open restaurants or chefs or passion projects, and they don't treat it like a business. The, and maybe a lot of these people made money somewhere else, so they don't need that mm -hmm. income. They're doing it you know, as a trophy. They're doing it to show off to their friends. And uh, when you go in and you have those processes, those procedures, and you count every penny, and you do inventory every week, um, you know, there's a way to, to be profitable with it. So that was like the biggest thing I learned from them. But also at the same time, I learned as you grow, as you scale, you can't be nimble. So when I was there, they were outdated on their technology. They're not now, like they, they yeah. ha are, have a very solid tech stack now. But when I left, I made it another one of our core pillars that we always wanna be testing whatever's gonna drive the industry forward. So we're always looking at new inventory management systems, new cloud solutions, new uh, HR solutions, and trying to improve our business every day. Where I feel like when it got to that size, they couldn't make a change quickly. It would take a year to roll out mm -hmm. something new. So we're fortunate to be small enough where we can pivot and make those you know, foundational decisions now as we prepare to grow. Is that something that you constantly look for? Or is that something that just comes up? As, a, as in, like, do you guys go out there and network with other people and, and, like, try to find what's the next big thing to be, like, ahead of the curve, like, early adopter? Or is it more like it just, at some point, you hear it so much, you're like, all right, that's probably a thing. We got to jump on it. Are you, like, both? Both. Yeah, m more... Uh, not so much the latter, because I think if we're hearing about it, then we're late to the party. You know, if other people are telling us about it, um, we want to be the ones that people are copying. We want to be the trendsetters, the forward thinkers, the ones that everybody's replicating, uh, both in systems and procedures and the business and what we actually produce that's guest facing. So, um, no, we, we try to find out sooner than that. We go to conventions, we travel, we network, we know, we do a lot of beta testing. There's some startups locally that we've worked with on some of the training module software that's out there that's app-based because the, the younger generation is a scrolling generation and they mm -hmm. learn through scrolling, they learn through interactive media uh, versus, you know, when when, I was younger, I did everything on spreadsheets and on, on Word docs, and that doesn't really translate to the younger generation. So that was something that we beta tested, and if it works out, um, you know, we got a great deal on software in the beginning, but the negative side to that is we've beta tested a number of programs that never w came to market. So you, you sometimes mm -hmm. waste time, but you find what works for you, um, and it's only like the executive level in my company that's doing it, so we're not wasting our operations team's time focusing on, on new technologies. Give us like an example of one of the um, yeah, latest technologies that, you, that you're implementing, because you know we have both background in tech and in hospitality, yeah. so I'm curious, is there something that you can talk about that you guys are implementing or have been implementing that made yeah. a significant impact, and, and what, what does it look like? So 
I'll tell you about it now because I think we're going to transition to try something new uh, next week. But as of right now, we're very happy with it. But it's called Margin Edge, and it's a software that's inventory management that integrates with your POS um, and our accounting software and our payroll software. So it's one cloud-based suite where I can see in real time actuals versus theoreticals on all of our food costs. I can find uh, deviations in inventory. I could figure out if it's theft or waste. So it's very, the data is powerful and we're able to really understand our business with it. And then what it did for the operations team is it sends, we scan in, we have, it's pretty elaborate process now, but we scan in all of our invoices to a third party that codes them and puts them in for us. So that opens up hours for our team mm. to focus on the floor instead of being in the office because the best managers in an office manage from the floor. They lead from the floor. They're touching tables. They're connecting with guests. If they have to be what we call, uh, you know, um, paperclip managers, uh, you know, if they're walking around and just uh, – with their office supplies and not necessarily on the floor, they can't give a positive guest experience. And really, that's that's the essence of what we do. We want to make people feel good. We want people to come in and have a great experience. And if you're in an office, you can't do that. So that would be the most recent tech that we've had a success with. What on the uh, customer facing side of it? Like, what do you do as far as like, is there is there like online advertising? Like, what? In, in your industry, in the, in the hospitality restaurant business, like what's a, what's something you can do to separate yourself from other people to get you know, eyes on the eyes on the price? I think with us, it starts with having a great concept. It starts with having something that people want to talk about and not telling people to talk about it. There's a lot of concepts now, primarily in like Scottsdale, that put up things that are strictly for the gram strictly for social media and they don't really have true design intent behind it it's just like a flashy neon sign it's gimmicky and we try to be much more pure and thoughtful in it we try to create something that is so badass that you want to take a picture of it and i think that it starts with that it starts with mm -hmm. doing something that is uh truly trend setting you know to to refer back to another term and then from there um, big focus on social. Uh, it, you know, Instagram is our core demographic. It's not too young. It's not too old. We find Facebook to be a. It's still relevant, but it's a bit of an older, older generation. Mm -hmm. uh, where TikTok is hard to to market on. We still do some TikTok, but you're looking to go viral on TikTok. You're looking for organic um, spread on TikTok. Where Instagram, you could still have. A uh, combination of paid and organic. It's become more of a pay-to-play platform as of recently, but that's our bread and butter. That's. Uh, I have so many. I have so many questions. I don't want to go off uh, off script <laughs> here, but um, I think obviously one of the pivotal moments was when you transitioned out of from the apprenticeship, the, like you called it, into doing your own thing. So, talk to us about pretty decent concept and talk to us about the first kind of deal that you did on your own because yeah. that is obviously you know probably one of the one of the tipping points for you and and take us into the world of how that how that felt because I'm sure there's some similar emotions and feelings that we shared on our end too when we started our own thing yeah so for me to be able to do it I had to commit fully and I put in a notice at my employer, and um, I was like, I, I got to leave. I'll give you a month, two months, whatever you need to replace me. I'm not going to leave you high and dry, um, but I have to leave so that I can network, so that I can raise capital, and I can get something off the ground. But if I'm working 70 hours plus a week, which is what the grind was back then, um, I can never do it. And they said, okay, we'll take it. What are you going to do? I'm going to open a restaurant. Okay, we believe in you. Wink. You know, nobody ever believes you when you tell them <laughs> you're going to open a restaurant. Um, so I just, I had to commit. And I put in that month notice, which turned into two, which turned into three. And, and then at a certain point, there was a restaurant opening across the street, another great group that was doing it. And um, I wanted to see them do it from a different perspective. So my strategy was to get a bartending position at night, be part of a new store opening for another well-known restaurant group, see how they do it with fresh eyes, 
And then I could shop my deck in the morning. I could try to find capital in the morning. I could look for the deals. I could tour space. I could do everything during the day. So it's like I was working a double every single day, but I got to see somebody else do it, which was very valuable. I saw somebody do it on not a big budget, on more of a budget like we would use, but still have impactful dollars spent. And um, then from there, I, uh, I bartended for a few months, which led to a consulting opportunity. and. I thought, well, let's pivot that strategy a little bit and let's go open restaurants, do everything for other people, but play with their money. So I did uh, three concepts while I was still networking, raising money, going to friends and family. And I found an opportunity in downtown Phoenix, which was very close to my heart because I spent a lot of time there. Uh, my wife and I moved downtown in 2008. We thought that this was the burgeoning scene where we wanted to be more craft focused. Uh, there was a bar called Bitter and Twisted that started that trend. Ross Simon, he's a, he's a friend, and he, he just did an incredible job steering the community in a direction, and I wanted to be part of that. So, you know, you guys are developers. When we look at a deal, we look at the real estate first. We look for the best piece of property with the best opportunity for success and the best deal, and we'll figure out a concept for that. So when I left the company, I left to open a high-end steakhouse. And I ended up opening a Mexican restaurant first because that's what that space needed. That's what downtown Phoenix needed at the time. And um, you know, we pivoted to get it done. And the guys I was consulting for, they thought I was doing a really good job. And they ended up being like 60% of my investor pool for my first concept. That's how I got it off the ground. Uh, the other like 30-ish percent was friends, family, and then uh, of course my wife and I put in. We bet everything. We sold our house. We seeded it. We did all the initial design. We signed a lease without all of the money raised. Like we we believed that we were going to get it done, and uh, and we did. We just had to commit. We there was no option to fail. If we failed, we would have been starting over. So all in, all, all the chips to the middle of the table. That's, that's how we did it. That's sometimes, I mean, you have to, right? Like uh, we always say like, there's a, you know, you got to burn the bridges. There's only one way to go from, you know, if you, if you leave like a door open and a lot of people just don't, don't ever give it 110%. I think, yeah, like going all in is super important. How long ago was that? Seven years ago. Like that number. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. every time, you know, we're betting everything. We bet everything on Renan Wolf. Again, we bet everything on trophy room and then we took all of our winnings and bet on carry on it's like everything that we're doing now self-funded we we take on a little bit of debt which uh, you know debt at the end of the day is us signing on for so if it doesn't work we're you know we're back to so every single time you know we're betting all in on on ourselves because we believe that that's the way to do it that's the way to build a company no no safety net no parachute when you, when you, so we talked about, you said you look for the real estate first, or I guess sometimes maybe that, you know, same thing gets brought to you, right? Somebody says, I have a great spot, you know, now that you, I mean, you have so many connections in the industry. Um, when you start a new concept or new project, a new restaurant, whatever you may want to call it, like, what are your processes and like, how do you attack, like, you know, starting like, basically a new business over again, right? Because you, every time you start a restaurant, you, it's like a brand new business again. Yeah, so we look for the best location. Or we, we after Ren and Wolf, we, we're looking for spots like Scottsdale, right, where everybody's looking, where everybody wants to be. And we were getting opportunities, but we found that we were chasing deals. And they weren't great deals. And we didn't feel the love like these developers really wanted us. So we took the mentality that instead of being the ones that are going to chase, we we're going to go build the garden to attract the bees to us. And um, now that we've done that, like we're getting, you know, we did that with Ren and Wolf, and we're getting much, much better opportunities out of market for Ren and Wolf 2, which we're looking at Houston right now in, a, in an amazing trade area that is – uh, you know, tons of upside for, for the business. And then it opened up secondary markets that are burgeoning and, and incredible opportunities and in places that are overlooked where we could be a marquee location, where we could be that marquee concept. So that's where we, or why we decided to go to Tempe. Um, Tempe, you look at it, there's a lot of density. There's a mm -hmm. lot of class A 
office. Uh, GoDaddy just last week announced that they're relocating their headquarters to Mill Avenue in the 100 Mill building. Um, you have a lot of high-rise residential that is not inexpensive to live in. So to us, when we look at it, we thought that that was an opportunity to be the Ross Simon of Tempe, to be the ones that usher in this new era of craft in an area that has none right now, that it's, mm. that's all college bars, yeah. you know? And there's, there's a place for that, and college bars are great, and you need that for community, but you need more than just a bunch of buckets of beer, and that's what we want to do in Tempe. What can you say about the concept in Tempe? So uh, I'm willing to tell you guys a little more. <laughs> We're doing a, a wood fire concept. Uh, there's going to be a big uh, Argentinian style wood fire grill in the middle of it. Over the top design. Imagine Ren and Wolf with a real budget. <laughs> and um, then we're doing a cocktail, 1970s inspired cocktail lounge attached to it. Very vibey. We're very proud of that one because of the equipment package we're bringing in. We're using the same equipment that they use at 11 Madison Park in New York, which is three Michelin star, was best restaurant in the world at one time. And same as Double Chicken Please, which was the best cocktail bar in the world last year. We ordered the same... Uh, bar equipment from Norway, and we're putting this on Mill Avenue, which is crazy because it's not a place that's not really known for that. But we felt like to make a change, you had to make a statement. When is that uh, plan to to be opening? This year. This year. <laughs> yeah, this year. <laughs> we uh, we like we aim to get things right, and we want it to be extremely dialed in because you only get one chance at a first impression. So rather than hit like state a hard date, we um, we wait until everything's perfect. The staff is trained. Because if you open too fast, that's that's a death knell for a lot of restaurants. Is that mm. I'm, I'm sure it is with construction and development. Like if you go and list a house before it's ready or start, I see it all the time on MLS. People posting pictures of a half finished house, they're devaluing their product. So we take that same uh, thought process. We want to we want it to be shown when it's done and ready. What do you like just in general? Because obviously, like we do real estate, you're, you're more in the in the in the hospitality. But there's a lot of people like listening doing other stuff, right? So, from a general entrepreneur perspective, what are some things that you can take out of your industry and apply to like general business? Like, what is something that you see people doing wrong when they start new businesses, or you know, what what are some of those like key factors for you to actually make something successful? Uh, underfunded is number one, is they don't have enough capital to make something happen. Um, number two would be not enough grit. If somebody wants to start a business, they have to live it. And when somebody tells me they want to start a business because they want free time and they want to travel more and they want to <laughs> see their kids more, they got it ass backwards. That's not how it works. When you start a business, everything in the beginning has to be secondary. It is your life, it is your identity, it is you getting it off the ground. So, you know, my wife and I, we have two kids and she knows that she's not gonna see me for 100 plus hours a week when we launch these new concepts because I'm gonna be living there. But we prepare our life for it. And it's a short cycle until you get it off. And if it, sometimes it's short, sometimes it could take a year, sometimes it could take longer. But that, uh, you know, unwillingness uh, to fail, you know, has to go in it. So that's the same across every business, every trade. You got to have the grit and you got to have uh, the staying power and you have to be willing to pivot and unwilling to fail. What's a, uh, if you weren't doing restaurants, what would be another industry that would spark your interest? Still be you playing drums. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> Is yeah. there anything else that you think, or you might even still be doing at some point where like, there was always something like another passion project or something like, Something Is there something else that intrigues you outside of hospitality? Real estate, of course. <laughs> no, but uh, being entrepreneurial, I would have started another business. You know, I've had a lot of different ideas uh, throughout the years. When Uber was a thing, I toyed around with starting a – and drinking and driving was a hot-button topic. This was mm. seven-plus years ago, seven to ten years ago. We played around with starting an app um, that would have had um, – a team of drivers drive around and drive you in your car home when you drank too much in Old Town. Like that was a business that we were thinking about starting 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, we went through, we, do, we did our due diligence and we, we realized there wasn't enough 
capital. It wasn't, it wasn't going to work. There wasn't enough profit upside because of the labor component to it. Like for something like that to work, for Uber to work, you needed a, 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 it to be a bit different. But, you know, we've gone through the exercise. So I would have started a business. I would have figured something out in that capacity and probably would have merged music with business, maybe start a drum school. I don't know. Something along those lines. Uh, that's pretty cool. There's definitely enough d drunk people in Scottsdale, so that, that, that <laughs> market uh, is definitely, Big market. Yeah. definitely yeah. there. Um, so you mentioned Renewolf um, in a different location, potentially as a kind of a marquee main statement. Um, um, what about Chico Malo in Miami? How's that doing, and how did you come up with putting that concept up in, up in Miami? Yeah, Chico Mala, Miami, lots of lessons learned with that one. E one thing, you know, you're always learning in business. And one thing that I didn't consider fully enough before opening something 2,400 plus miles away was supply chain. You know, it's obvious when you think about it, but mm -hmm. where are you going to get your masa? Where are you going to get your peppers from? So learn that lesson, which is why we're going to focus to a regional scale on the next one with something that, you know, is ingredient driven like Chico Malo, but also being willing to pivot. So we always open that with the intent to be more nightlife focused. There's a 50 seat outdoor bar with a stage and a full um, like club level sound and audio light system. And then inside, we built a 12 seat uh, agave focused mixology bar. The design is much more upscale, um, but we had to pivot it for that market. We had to change the menu a bit to be suitable for them because they don't know what authentic Mexican food is and their, their palate was very different. They were expecting, they couldn't handle the heat in the same way. We got a lot of complaints for dishes that are award winning in Phoenix. And um, you know, you could be true to yourself to a point, but mm -hmm. you don't want to be true to yourself to go out of business. So we pivoted to make the concept successful, and, and now it's, uh, you know, it's beloved by the community, and we have salsa nights where people are coming and dancing. We have candle night concert, uh, candlelight concert nights, DJs on the weekend, a huge party brunch on Saturdays and Sundays where you know, everybody gets up and salsas around with their <laughs> unlimited <laughs> bottomless mimosas. <laughs> But what we learned there is it's a much later crowd. Like people don't even think about eating until 10 p.m. Yeah, it's very different. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we just ran through the same scenario, like doing a project in Florida and, you know, stuff that's so easy here, you, like so far away. Like how did you guys not, like where do we, it's very different. Um, something on the, on the you know, you, you've been doing this for seven years yourself. You've been doing in the business for a long time. What has changed in the industry in the last like 10, 15 years? What do you say, how has yeah. it like evolved or like even further back? Like what are some of the big changes from now looking back? COVID changed everything. COVID changed work ethic, changed a lot of our personnel, a lot of our kitchen staff pivoted out of necessity to provide for their families to companies like Amazon and they didn't come back. So when you hear there's like a worker shortage in hospitality, that's a big part of it. And then you know, there's immigration problems. And, and so uh, the biggest thing to change has been the labor pool and the, and the people willing and wanting to look at it as a, as a career. Um, it's getting better. You know, we fortunately have always focused on culture and we pay our staff incredibly well. We are independent, so I don't have corporate overhead to feed. Um, just investors, which are very happy with all of their uh, investments so far. So being that going back to nimble and being smaller, mm -hmm. we have a competitive advantage being able to pay top of market and be a place where people are happy to come to work. So thankfully, we have, that's how we've you know, gone against that COVID mentality. But you know, back in the day, you would hear about the Gordon Ramsay type chefs just screaming and you'd have militant kitchens and that doesn't exist anymore. If you don't, if you're not happy, if you don't know your team, if you don't know everybody's name and a little bit about them, and if you aren't greeting them when they come in, like you create that positive environment. And that's uh, been the biggest change where it used to be more like a military base and now has to be like the friend zone. So follow up question on that. What do you think? 2035 what's going to be something in the in the industry that maybe doesn't ex like what could you see being another like maybe big change or a big 
maybe even again, again on the consumer side, right? Is that is something going to change in the next 10 years? Or Yeah, you're going to have uh, the entry level, like fast food, QSR, go more automated. You're going to have a lot of robotics making your burgers at Wendy's, et cetera. Uh, dynamic pricing is another thing that's going to come to a lot of these fast food. And it's already starting, I, I believe, with Wendy's. Uh, but based on the time that you go, it's going to be more expensive. Surge pricing to keep the drive through lines down, to spread the labor out, to increase the time that they can make money. So that's the QSR um, solution to the problems today. And then you're going to have kind of like a polarization of the market. You're, I think middle market restaurants are going to disappear and you're just gonna, because you can't afford the high volume concepts anymore with the way prices, price of uh, cost of goods is going and labor is going, you either have to be top of market, fine dining, affluent or like upper middle tier, or you gotta go fully automated and robotic and, and incorporate a lot more tech because of the labor costs. Do you see some uh, similarities with uh, um kind of the retail side of, for example, shopping, right? Where experiences become a lot more uh, immersive and a lot of those top high-end brands make it an experience mm -hmm. to go to their stores. Is that something that you see for yourself in your concepts too? Because certainly we as uh, good customers of all those concepts um, feel like it's, it's always an experience independently of whether you've been there once um, or whether you've been there multiple times, right? How, right? how does that play into your concepts? We're all in on being immersive and, and transporting you somewhere for the 90 minutes to three hours that we have you. We want it to be a special place. Um, we don't want to be the distraction. We want to create the canvas for you to have a great experience with whoever you're there with. That is our goal. So the service should never be the star. They should never get in the way, but they should do everything seamlessly to make sure that you have a perfect uh, event. The food should always be, you know, perfect, but not, not necessarily like you're not, we're not trying to be a three Michelin star restaurant. We're trying to be a great place where everything works together. So when you look at a restaurant, it's design, it's food, it's beverage, it's service. And if we can achieve very high marks on all four, then, then we're doing our jobs correctly. How does entertainment play into that? Are there some concepts coming where there's s s entertainment factor, just like yeah. you mentioned at uh, Chico Malo in Miami? We are, yeah. So one of our cocktail concepts is going to have a piano component to it. I believe that people, like, so there is, there's been a lot of <laughs> studies recently about where the younger generations are looking to go and where they're looking to drink specifically. And the ultra club generation is doesn't exist anymore and if you look at the trajectory of like immersive cocktail bars and nightclubs mega nightclubs they're closing and part of that is that the younger generation prefers to go to festivals they'd rather go to coachella and edc than go to a mega nightclub at night and but what they're choosing to do instead are things like carry on things like trophy room where they could still go have great cocktails they could sit down but they're immersed they want to be Entertain. They don't want to just go get shit faced on vodka soda and yeah. vodka and Red Bull anymore. So what is, what is carry on? <laughs> so we're getting to carry on. Uh, <laughs> carry on <laughs> is our 1970s inspired uh, tribute to a 747 uh, jet. So the lounge on a 1970s 747 jet. It's going to take you back. There's going to be a show control. We're going to have more than 14 monitors, a uh, whole like 3D content created. So it looks like you're taking off and landing. We hired a pretty famous comedian to do the voiceover work within it. Uh, all of the staff is gonna be dressed period authentic. The drinks are period authentic. We have somebody from the best bar in America, which we haven't announced yet, that did the cocktail program, our final tastings next week. Next week. We've already gone through three and they're phenomenal. So we are, shooting for the stars with this one because it's going to be not just immersive but some of the best cocktails that you can have in the valley and then food which type of cuisine so we won't be doing proper food in carry on uh instead we'll be uh packaging chef driven uh snacks that you would see on an airplane that go along with the destination so every year we're going to switch it up you're going to take off and land in different destinations the first one is san francisco to Mexico City. 
And we did that because there's, um, there's a lot, there's a great cocktail culture in both cities. There's a great food culture in both cities and a lot to be inspired by. Additionally, throughout the year, we're going to do um, pop-ups with great bars from those cities where we bring them in, we host them, and we do bar takeovers in the airplane. You, ha you talked about, like, you know, you want to take care of the clients while they're there for the 30 to 90 minutes. Um, one of the things, I mean, we've been there many times now, the trophy room, there's no, no cell phones allowed. Um, mm -hmm. What was the thought process behind it, and what's the feedback from, from, the, from the guests? The thought was we were tired of everybody pulling out their cell phone with a flash on in the middle of the dining room and ruining everybody's experience. And we – and – or walking by a table that's clearly on a date and both of them are on their phone scrolling on social media. And we wanted to go, we wanted to create an environment that was intimate and immersive, but immersive because we were taking that phone away. And when we decided to do this, we had investors tell us we were crazy. We had friends, colleagues, peers tell us that we're crazy, that nobody's gonna like this, that uh, we had, we had potential guests telling us that it's a safety concern because their kids might have a babysitter and they won't know if there's an emergency. I'm like, well, what did people do 20 years ago? Like, your phone's less than 10 feet away. So we stuck to our guns, decided to do it, and it has become beloved. It is like a, an excellent business spot to get a deal done where there's no distractions. It's an excellent date spot. It's an excellent place to go with friends that you might not have seen in a long time and just connect and enjoy the space. And if you look around, there's a lot of eye candy to look at. As far as the decoration of the mm -hmm. room, uh, we, we, spent, we spared no expense on creating something that is truly special. And I agree. I mean, we've been there. Like I said, it, it's, it's interesting when you do the dinner first, right, mm -hmm. with your phones and you drop them off, you get in there, how much better the conversation is. And, and it's very, uh, I think it's a great experience. Um, so it's I, weird though I, at first, right? You it's, know, it's weird at first. You always like the one thing, you, that's how much you realize you need your phone. It's like you sit there and you're like, oh, uh, let me show you. You want to show a picture? And you're like, oh, I can't. <laughs> yeah. Like it's not even about the texting or looking, stuff, but you, you're so used to like always pulling something out. Well, and then, but it vibrates. Yeah. Yeah. But like after <laughs> yeah. 10, 15 <laughs> minutes, answer. you're like, you pass that point. You, you yeah. don't reach, you, you accept it's not there and you just explain what was on that picture. You're like, that's what it looked like. That's what we did. Like, I think it's a, a great concept. I, I think it's quite frankly for a dinner concept, also not not, not a bad idea. Yeah, you know? just a general. Yeah, I have a feeling we're gonna get ripped off with that one, and uh, that that would be fine. You know, I don't. I look at it as taking the baton and adding another layer. So if somebody else does it, I would welcome it and probably go. Uh, it's never been about secrecy. That was one of the misconceptions in the beginning, and with some of the influencers that we had come through, is that it thought it was a secret concept, and that we have all of these things behind the curtain that we don't want you to see or, or talk about. But that was never really it. It was always about human connection. That was the social experiment that we were working with behind the bar, and we just happened to put some cool things worth talking about after inside of it. But it's not like, you know, the way that some people pitched it in the beginning, it sounded like it was an escape room or something. And that's, yeah. you know, that's not it. It's definitely about connecting and enjoying some, you know, amazing cocktails with friends and not to not be distracted. Is there is there any concepts in, in let's just talk about Phoenix area for now, but that you feel like they're still missing or there's opportunity that you've maybe seen summer traveling? I mean, we're from Europe, so different type of restaurants, different type of food that we can't find here. Is there anything that you think there's there's an opportunity or that's just there's not enough of? I think you can, you know, Phoenix is large enough now that I think you can find just about everything and, and everything done relatively well. I don't think that there's any big gaping holes. Uh, you could have more of the live entertainment that is coming back. This, you know, the supper clubs of the 20s um or you know delilah in vegas is one um and, but there are concepts like that in development with other groups uh that are coming so i wouldn't say any gaping holes but you can always improve we could use more where phoenix is excelling is in the cocktail community like our cocktail community is internationally recognized as being a, a top destination and there's a a couple key people in the valley that are pushing that forward we need the food side to catch up a bit. You know, we could use some two, three Michelin star level restaurants in Phoenix that could really take us over the top. And there's people trying, um, but we're not quite there yet. 
what's the best one like as far as the Brand ranking Wolf. as a Michelin? <laughs> no, like no. is there like is there a Michelin? <laughs> yeah. I don't even know. Is there one? A Michelin no, restaurant? so Michelin doesn't come here. James Beard does, and there's a lot of guys doing. But the James Beard here is more about authenticity. You know, so Bacanora is mm -hmm. a darling right now, and and he just did everything. Uh, simple, incredibly well, great ingredients, but you know, there's nothing really earth shattering in, in, in what they're doing. And I mean, no just, I love that restaurant. Yeah, it's a um, good spot. yeah, but we can definitely, you know, push it forward. I think, I think there's some on the creativity side, uh, you know, Binkley's just announced that they're closing. He was one that was pushing the envelope forward and, and we're losing that. Um, so that would be the, the gaping hole I would see. Why do you think something like this is failing, even though it's kind of missing just the way it the concept or is the mark like what what could be the reason for something like that i think uh there hasn't been anybody to do it in a noteworthy way and you have to do it ex exceptionally well every single time there are some talented chefs that have recently opened some similar restaurants to what i'm talking about and we'll see if they can last the stand the test of time um But I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be able to say why it hasn't worked. You know, Phoenix might not have been ready for it, but I think we are now with where the cocktail community has proven you can go. I think you could take food there too. Have you uh, have you seen the news about the release at the Ritz Carlton that they're gonna have a Chinese high end restaurant that is? Yeah. I'm blanking on the Mot name. Mott 32. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. So there's one at the Venetian Palazzo in Vegas too. Which is a great restaurant. So, so these type of news, obviously, we know that project's been it's been delayed, but it's going to happen eventually. Like, is that is that are these the things that that are missing here uh, to take food to the next level? You know, Ma is a great restaurant. Um, yes, uh, I think that it could push it forward. Um, the independents, the locals are what are going to create and craft a community. Mott 32 is still a transplant from somewhere else. There was a transplant from somewhere else. You know, it's a Chinese restaurant that went to Vegas that's now coming to Scottsdale. So that doesn't, that doesn't put our culinary scene on the map in any significant way. That just shows that you know, we are worthy of that sort of investment and that sort of concept coming to Scottsdale. But we need local creators, people that are going to inspire nationally that are taking a bet and doing something special in Arizona. That's yeah. what we need. And I think we've kind of seeing right now that coming from Vegas, I'm not going to name names, but coming from Vegas doesn't necessarily mean it's like, you know, popping an <laughs> successful situation here. Um, you know, so I, yeah, I agree. I mean, just, that's just a name. And if it's not the same as the original, then that that's going to, you know, show really quick. And then, you well, know. and th there are benefits to being like a second or third location that has a big budget. Um, you figure things out. You are better on your second and third version and you have more financial success. So if you're continuing to push your company forward, you can make a bigger investment. I, I know that the Renault Wolf we open in Houston is going to cost like four or five times as much because we know what it is now and we're going to push that envelope forward. We saw a jump from Chico Mala 1 to Chico Mala 2 And then that made us do Chico Mala 1.5 in Phoenix in August of this past year, where we went through and remodeled the whole thing because we wanted to continue to improve it and make it look better. So uh, it's not a bad thing getting second and thirds, but it doesn't put you, you know, on the map uh, as far as culinary goes. What would you say is the biggest misconception about the restaurant industry? That it's glamorous, you know, that it's easy, um, yeah, that it's profitable. I think in most instances, it's very hard to make a profit. We're fortunate to have had a string of successes. Um, but I, I take that down to how diligent we are with the fundamentals of the business. Um, but the misconception is, I think that there's this, this misconception, especially from staff members, that you know, ownership is making so much money. But what they don't realize is that a very profitable restaurant makes six to eight percent um, profit on their gross sales, where a server, how much do you tip a server? 20%. So that server is making twice as much as ownership on the same restaurant, on the same sales, on what we created. Crazy. Uh, pretty decent concepts. Where do you see, where do you see your, your thing in five to 10 years? Like what's, what's in, in your portfolio and you know, what, what are the, the plans and goals? Well, we're opening steakhouse this year. We're opening a, uh, 
Woodfire Restaurant in Tempe, as you know, we're doing a second Woodfire Restaurant in Tempe on the opposite end of Mill in 2025. It's going to be Woodfire Italian with a uh, the speakeasy. You know, I, I we we're trying to get off the speakeasy train, but this one's a really special idea, completely immersive, going to be over the top. Too early to share those details. Um, then we're going to start expanding. So we look at Phoenix as our incubator market. We're going to put our best ideas here because this is home. This is where we're proud to be. And then we're going to take those ideas that work and take them out of market and create little hubs, uh, nucleuses of concepts to scale from. Our first endeavor is going to be in Texas. We feel like it's a similar market to here with a lot of upside. So we're going to open Ren and Wolf and then take a second concept there and then scale naturally. But uh, I would say in five to 10 years, we'll have, well, just by the end of 2025, we're going to have 11 concepts. And uh, in five to 10 years, we'll get behind one to, uh, to scale and, and make some waves nationally. And then we eventually would like to have a presence in um, LA, New York, some of the bigger markets, because if we want to be a uh, national player, you have to have a presence in those markets. Could you see yourself adding anything else to the to the portfolio, like hotels or any any other types of hospitality, restaurant, business, but in the same same yes. realm of space? Yeah, we are always looking um, for those types of opportunities. And the most you know, fascinating thing to us where we would like to go with our company, and I don't know that that's five years, it's, it's probably further than five to 10 because we'd have to sell a concept to capitalize <laughs> a big investment like a hotel because we, we, don't, we don't do anything inexpensive, going back to that being underfunded comment in the beginning. You know, and to do it, we would want to make waves and we would want to do something big, grandiose. Um, but to have a hotel, that is the ultimate in hospitality. That is touching on somebody's experience from the moment they check in to their dinner, to the cocktail concept, because of course you would have one, to maybe some form of entertainment concept, to the breakfast concept, to the rooms, to every little detail, to the spa, like curating that experience for somebody. When you talk about making somebody feel good, if you can knock it out of the park at a hotel, like that would be the ultimate challenge, and I think it would be a very fulfilling challenge. Well, Enough about business. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about uh, life outside of work. Um, do you still do music outside of work? Are you still behind the drums? It's an escape, yeah. I still, I still play here and there. I'll make a cameo and a music video every once in a while and lay down some, some drums for a track here and there. It's not the primary focus. Now it's, uh, you know, it's an escape and everybody needs like a healthy escape. I also have a five-year-old that I'm trying to teach drums. So, you know, maybe he'll follow in my footsteps and uh, try to be a rock star too. That's actually always a question I ask because I'm a dad. Like, how does being a dad impact your, you know, your, your life, your work, your motivation, your inspiration, like everything? Like, how does it change everything? I feel like making a dad made me a much more aware, a better person. You know, before bit more self-serving you know you're you're working for yourself you're working to build your brand now you have to think about little lives that you've brought and and making them good decent people and making sure they're not spoiled and it's uh you know it's a it's a challenge but it um it's a very healthy one and and i don't know that there's anything more fulfilling than like being a parent i agree so outside of being a parent and hitting the drums as an escape. What else do you, what else do you enjoy? Traveling. We, you know, but for with purpose and with inspiration. So we will go to a market, and we'll have five, six, seven meals in in one day. You know, we'll try to do two or three lunches, hit a happy hour spot, and do four dinners. And after the first two <laughs> can we come on the next trip <laughs> yeah it sounds it sounds fun but after the second one it becomes work and <laughs> you know you're ordering half the menu you're trying to take a bite of everything but that's how you stay inspired that's how you really go out there and see what other people are doing because you can't you can't push an envelope forward if you don't know where the envelope is so um those are the most inspirational trips we go to california a lot we just went to chicago 
Additionally, we like to travel and, and meet with our suppliers, our purveyors. We went to Guadalajara last year, um, stayed at the Patron Hacienda. We, as I mentioned, we just went to Chicago a couple weeks ago and toured all of our meatpacking facilities. We wanted to know uh, everywhere along the supply chain where we're sourcing our products from. So, you know, it's not really an escape from work, but it is. You know, we have our we have our fun and our leisure when we're on that. But that is like. That's how we fill up our lives. It's all it's all work, uh, all the time. And if we can figure out a way to do work and travel, then we're going to do that. And it shows that you're passionate about it. You like, I mean, we're the same way. We so as soon as we land somewhere, we start looking at houses, going to open <laughs> houses, meet brokers, and yeah. it's it's the same thing. Yeah. Um, you you go to the Phoenix Suns a lot. Let's talk about Arizona sports for a second. Uh, I mean, there's no oh, NHL man. anymore. I don't know <laughs> yeah. if you ever went, but what are your thoughts on the Suns? The Suns. I uh, I used to go to games at the Madhouse on McDowell, you know, at the original Coliseum. I remember as a kid in 1992 walking through the locker rooms when America West Arena at the time was new. I remember the finals run in, what was that, 93. You know, I went to a bunch of the games in the last finals run, and it's just the most frustrating experience to be a Phoenix Suns fan because I can never <laughs> get all the way there. But I love the team. I love to go. Um, I love the new ownership. I think they're doing a great job in pushing it forward. I think we have a, a good group of personalities on the team right now. So I'm a huge Suns fan. Uh, I just wish that they could uh, win it all one day. What's missing on the hospitality food side in there? Some of our concepts. You know? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, there's some arenas really pushing the envelope forward in Brooklyn. Um, the you know, courtside seats have a collaboration with Major Food Group where um, there's like a whole restaurant inside and you're just really taken to that next level. And, and there are similar offerings at um, Footprint Center, but not quite to the level mm. as there are in some other areas. So obviously you guys love traveling and, and so do we. Give us like your, your most recent best travel experience where you guys just had a blast and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe share with us uh, either a story or like a little travel hack that you that you guys use? Uh, well, you know, we just <laughs> talked about a few of them. Um, you know, the most memorable recently, we we had to change last minute um, where we were going to go. We were supposed to go somewhere domestic. It ended up still being domestic. But um, for one reason or another, we were not able to go to that destination anymore. So at 7 PM, like, well, we already have the time. We already got everything covered. Let's just go somewhere else. Where do you want to go? And we were able to transition our tickets from Nashville to uh, Hawaii. And we just did a spur of the moment trip where less than 12 hours later, uh, we were in Oahu with no set rigid schedule, um, just kind of discovering the island. And I hadn't been on a trip like that. Usually, I'm a planner. Everything I go down to the minute, I know where we're supposed to be, what we're doing. I have an entertainment thing. And it was a nice and welcome change of pace just to spend time with the kids, you know, see my five-year-old start to figure out how to swim and to slow it down for a minute. And I didn't think I enjoyed that pace of life, but it was nice for one trip. How long was the trip? It was only like four days, you know. Okay. wasn't very long. Okay, I'll, I'll do a couple different questions. Um, What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Hmm. That's a tough one. I received a lot of really good advice. Um, you know, re I'll go with one r recent, and it's uh, it's I've adopted this piece of advice and made it one of our core competencies in in hiring, and it is to. Um, Hire slow, you know, take your time with it. Make sure that they are the right fit culturally, that there's good team chemistry. We stage everybody. Are you familiar with the term stage? It's a working interview. Uh, so you come in, spend a couple hours with the team, um, and make sure that they're the right fit. And make sure that it's as much for them as it is for us. Mm. We'll have multiple interviews, even if it's just for a host. They have to interview with at least two managers before they come in, and then we train. We train very hard, but that's all to manage easy. If it doesn't work, it's, it's, it's fire fast. So it's hire slow, 
fire fast is uh, the new best advice I've had recently. It's the worst piece of advice. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I was once told that you should hire based on experience. And I've made a lot of mistakes doing that, hiring people that had incredible resumes. Because what I've found is that when you hire somebody with an incredible resume that is commanding top of the market rate, which I'm not cheap, you know, I will pay a great salary, what I find is I'm getting somebody in that um, has already paid their dues with somebody else. They've already grinded for somebody else. Mm -hmm. And when they come into us, they feel like it's a reward. They feel like they've done something, but we're an upstart company. So at this phase, hiring experience um, isn't something I look for anymore. Now it is hiring personality. It is hiring good people, happy people that you want to be around with every day because you see your staff more than you see your own family. Okay, last question that we ask everybody. Um, if you had the chance to sit down with 16-year-old Teddy, what would you tell yourself? Like, how would you, like, what would you, what kind of advice would you give yourself? I would say jump all in earlier. Um, don't delay. Find something that you love and, and just go all in for it. Or um, find something that you're really good at and find a passion for it. So uh, I didn't have either of those guiding principles when I was 16. When I was 16, the only guiding principle I had, which was sound advice, but it's old school advice, was go to college and get a degree. It doesn't matter what it's in. If you have that piece of paper, you can get a job and you're gonna be set for life. And if I went back to 16-year-old Teddy, I would say, yes, it's important, but go all in on something. Don't just figure it out later, because that's where student loan debt is. That's where people mess their whole life up, is by not having any sort of plan, either not being passionate and jumping all in, uh, or finding something that they're good at and jumping all in. Okay, well, I guess that's a, that's a wrap. Uh, thank you so much for coming yeah. uh, to our podcast today, uh, Teddy. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we were looking forward to this for, for a long time. Uh, thank you for sharing all the insights. We are super pumped for the upcoming uh, uh, concepts. And uh, before we close out, where can, we, where can people find you, your business, social profiles, contact information? Yeah, so every one of our um, concepts has their own Instagram. And that really is where we have our most customer-facing you know, guest interaction through DMs. Uh, and they all have websites, but they're fairly simple. So I would push everybody to uh, Instagram handles. So it's going to be Alan putting all those down in the description <laughs> below. So have fun, yeah. Alan. We'll make sure nothing's missing. Um, and then also make sure to, uh, again, like, subscribe, follow. Um, find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, YouTube, and everywhere else. So we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Um, we'll see you guys on the next one. Teddy, thanks again. Patrick, Alan, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.